Okay, hello everyone. Today we're going to be learning a little bit about medieval post-classical China. Um, this is from about the 6th century to the 13th century. So I want to kind of look at some of the uh, innovations and some of the cultural attributes of post-classical China, how the political forms kind of change but stay the same, and uh, hopefully you'll learn a little bit about uh, China from some of these slides. So again, there are going to be new dynasties, the mandate of heaven and the dynastic cycle continue. So it's another day, another dynasty. We've got three that we're going to um, be introduced to or encounter today. And I know you've already started to read or many of you have finished reading about them, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of the more important things that you're going to need to know uh, about uh, China during the Middle Ages. So the first is the Sui dynasty. It's a very, very short-lived dynasty. Um, it's only around for about one or two emperors. Um, then that's followed by the Tang, which is around for about 300 years. And then lastly, followed uh, by the Song, which is also around for about another 300 years. And uh, we're getting to the point in the course where we can start trying to kind of come up with mnemonic devices to help us remember the dynasties. Uh, one of the more famous ways to do this is through the Chinese dynasty song. So if you're familiar with the the uh, song, um, Are You Sleeping, Brother John, or Farah Jaka, Farah Jaka, Farah Jaka, Dormez-vous, Dormez-vous, Santa la matine, Santa la matine, Ding, ding, dong, ding, ding, dong. If you're familiar with that, forgive me for my hor horrific singing, but if you're familiar with that song, then you can put that all the Chinese dynasties to that uh, tune, and it goes something like this. Shang Zhou Qin Han, Shang Zhou Qin Han, Sui Tang Song, Sui Tang Song, Yuan Mingqing Republic, Yuan Mingqing Republic, Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping. All right, so again, apologies. I'll be here all week. So yeah, so the Sui are around for a very, very short amount of time, literally two emperors, I believe. Um, but they were the first to kind of reestablish China, reunify China after the collapse of the classical Han. Emperor Wen reestablishes central authority and under his family uh, crest, the Sui. Uh, you'll notice that the Sui are not as large as the Han had been, but they do control the interior heartland of China. Um, one of the more important things, or probably the most important thing you need to know about the Sui, is that they create this massive canal. This is a man-made river, essentially. It's 1,100-mile man-made waterway, which basically connected the two uh, major east-west rivers of China, the uh, Huanghe River and the Yangtze River Valley. So it connects basically north to south, um, Beijing to Hangzhou. And it becomes this north-south artery that connects all of the northern cities with the southern agricultural produce and, and uh, uh, lands to the south that were important for economic vitality in China. Uh, it's still around today, it's still used today in China. Very, very important. Uh, extremely long, extreme. And imagine, you know, this is made during the Middle Ages and it's done by hand. They didn't have like, you know, uh, huge, huge machines to do the digging and um, those kinds of things. So that's just a remarkable innovation by the Chinese during the Sui. Um, but of course, this, you know, despite the fact that they're making these huge technological innovations and they're laying the foundations for later uh, dynasties, in order to build something that massive, that, you know, awesome, if you will, that required a lot of peasant labor and it required the government to be very, very forceful and very harsh and uh, punish people that were not working. And um, the people felt that they were being overworked and that they were having the tax burden was falling to the lower classes. And so, you know, when people don't have hope and they don't see an end to their suffering and misery, that usually ends in a revolution, which is what happened uh, with the sway. They only last for a couple of of emperors until the people had had enough. But it's important to remember that it had it not been for the Sui, you know, the latter golden age of the Tong and the Sung might not have been as successful. And definitely the, the Grand Canal uh, connecting North and the South definitely had a huge impact on um, the evolution of China going forward. And I think it's interesting to think about, you know, when we study the ancient Chinese uh, era, let me give my little laser pointer here. 
uh, remember the Shang and the Zhou dynasties, they eventually um, collapse. And it is the Qin uh, who are the ones that kind of reunified China after the ancient period. And if you recall, the Qin was also a very short-lived, brutal, Shi Huangdi was very brutal to the people um, when he was building, constructing the Great Wall of China um, and unified the country by force, used the philosophy of legalism to kind of, you know, rule with a harsh, you know, punitive hand. And because of that short, brutal, but but effective period, it was the golden age, the Han period that um, reaped the benefits of that. Just as after the Han collapses, it is the very short-lived Sui who also kind of, you know, is this very short-lived dynasty, very harsh ruling, but establishes some infrastructure, establishes some, you know, economic and political foundations that the Tang and the Song are the beneficiaries of. So it's almost like the, the almost the exact same kind of history repeating itself again in the medieval period. Okay, so eventually the Sui dynasty is no more. It's replaced by the uh, Middle Age Tang dynasty, another kind of golden age of Chinese history. And just by kind of looking at the borders of the Tang dynasty, you can see that it's much more expansive. It's much larger than previous dynasties have been. They use their military to kind of expand control into Southeast Asia, into the northern part of the Korean Peninsula, um, northern part of Champa and Annam, which later becomes Vietnam. They're stretching into Tibet and most notably into the Central Asian Gobi Desert and uh, Plateau, which is kind of what uh, is connecting China to the Silk Road. So you can see that the Tang were obviously interested in controlling the trade and controlling, you know, taxing the trade that might have been taking place uh, between uh, East China, East Asia, and Central Asia. Tang Dynasty is also very significant in that it is a period, as I said, of gold. It's a golden age period, but a period of kind of burgeoning art, um, poetry, writing, um, you know, painting. It's also a period of advance in science and technology, as we'll see later. And because of the interactions that the Tang Dynasty are having with the rest of um, East Asia and Central Asia, you see a lot of kind of cosmopolitanism, a lot of diversity, a lot of new religious traditions and beliefs entering China. Uh, and also the Chinese um, culture and their beliefs uh, disseminating outward to other regions like Korea, Vietnam, and later Japan. And I kind of, if you look at the kind of the outline of the tongue, I think it kind of looks like a dragon. What do you see? So yes, one of these religious traditions that start to become very, very popular that it started to kind of come into China during the latter Han dynasty really, really takes off during the Tang dynasty. And of course, that's Buddhism. And Buddhism reaches its height in China during the Tang dynasty. It becomes very, very favored by the ruling elites. Um, there is a kind of a spiritual thirst for kind of a cosmic belief system in China, which didn't really have a religious tradition that taught what happens after we die. Um, Confucianism, legalism, Taoism aren't really those kind of cosmic um, religions or belief systems. They're more, um, you know, philosophies on the best way to live or how to order ourselves. So Buddhism fulfilled the spiritual need in China that was uh, perhaps lacking in the earlier classical and ancient periods. Uh, now, it's not to say that Confucianism goes away. It's still very, very important in the Ch in the Tang era, as well as every era in Chinese history. It still guides kind of the social realm of the government and, you know, relations between family members and the importance of being an educated, superior person. But now, for the first time, Buddhism is really coming in and uh, taking hold of China and really kind of impacting um, China, the flavor of Chinese culture and society uh, like it had never done before. And it's not a surprise that that happens. I mean, obviously, Buddhism is very important along the Silk Road trade networks and as 
China expands further and further west, they're going to be encountering more of those um, kind of different, you know, foreign, quote unquote, uh, belief systems. So in class, what you have is a handout, a reading on um, about a Chinese monk, Zhuan Zhang, who leaves China and wants to know a little bit more about Buddhism. And so I'm going to let you read that. It's only looks like three, four paragraphs on one on uh, one front side of the handout. As you're reading, what I'd like you to do, and you can pause the video, but what I'd like you to do is kind of underline key points in the reading. Um, star may be the most important sentence, in your opinion, in the whole um, reading, and then box some unknown vocabulary words as you're going through the reading. So go ahead and pause the video now and get a, a copy of the handout on Zhuang Song. So welcome back. And uh, as, as Buddhism becomes more familiar with Chinese people and Chinese rulers, you start to see a lot of public support and government support given to Buddhist temples. They become tax exempt. A lot of monasteries are built throughout China. Um, there's a, a huge emphasis on Buddhism, at least in the early Tang Dynasty, and they definitely receive a lot of state support. So China was growing in its influence and in its power, and because of that, they're able to spread a lot of their own culture across different regions of East Asia and Southeast Asia, as you can see from the map, uh, ideas on government, ideas on you know, porcelain making, printing, writing, uh, Confucian ideals on how to properly order um, you know, the, the bureaucracies of different uh, governments begin to spread to places like Vietnam, Korea, and Japan. And so China is the kind of the hegemon or central main power of the region. And so, of course, its culture becomes very, becomes adopted by many of the other civilizations neighboring surrounding China. And this process of spreading Chinese influence and culture, uh, if you can look up here at the top, is called... Sinification, Sinification. And there were several things that um, that did spread to these different regions. For example, in Korea, um, Korea kind of is conquered by the Chinese, but then they're allowed to continue their own systems of government and kind of control their own affairs. But, uh, you know, they're kind of a vassal state, if you will, to the Tang dynasty. So the Silla dynasty was the you know, long-lasting, predominant Korean dynasty during this period. And during this Silla dynasty, where when they are beholden to China, they're adopting a lot of Chinese ideas like the civil service exam. Buddhism begins to spread into Korea during this time period, and the state ideology becomes Confucian. In Japan, um, you know, remember back to our discussion on feudal structures, Japan is still very decentralized, but they are starting to kind of tried to bring the different uh, feudal kingdoms together under the Yamamoto. And uh, they're very also very strongly influenced by Chinese ideas of Confucianism. And uh, Zen Buddhism or Chan Buddhism is a type of Buddhism that spreads into Japan during this time period. But you can also see Chinese influence in the writing and education and art and things like that. Uh, in, in Japan as well. But Japan wasn't really essentially conquered by the Chinese as the Koreans had been, but they're, you know, they're still a little bit more independent, but, but still heavily influenced by the, you know, they were still revolving around this huge sun that is, that is China. And then lastly, Vietnam. Vietnam wasn't known as Vietnam back then. It was Champa and Anam which become kind of united over the centuries into this thing that we call Vietnam and Southeast Asia. And uh, they were, out of all of the three of these, kind of probably the most resistant to, you know, they, they fought back harder against the Chinese incursions. And there was, there was always a, a Vietnamese rebellion going on uh, in Southern China. And, uh, but yet at the same time, they still too also are influenced by Chinese um cultural aspects like Buddhism it spreads into Vietnam during this period through China, Taoism in art and Taoism in 
paintings is very prevalent in, in Viet Vietnamese culture as well as Chinese architecture. They even adopt some kinds of irrigation technologies from, uh, from China as well. China is also expanding westward. They reach all the way through kind of the Silk Road region here. Uh, and they eventually come into contact with the other great power of the medieval era, which is the Abbasid Caliphate. So the Abbasid Caliphate would be this kind of butterscotch colored uh, region here, as we've already made a map about and studied. And then the Chinese the, under the Tong is this kind of this light yellow color. And eventually they meet uh, their armies, their forces through expansion meet at this place called Talas River. And it's basically the Ali Frazier fight or the King Kong versus Godzilla. The two big powers have it out. And uh, I don't know if you can recall back to when we were studying the uh, Arab achievements or the Abbasid achievements of their golden age. Remember, they had adapted uh, some of the printing technologies that they had in, uh encountered from their interactions with the Chinese, it starts here at the Battle of Talas River. One of the prisoners taken by um, the Islamic forces was a Chinese scholar or a scribe that kind of, and, and, and somebody that was technologically had a lot of expertise with printing and woodblock printing and movable type and was able to kind of diffuse that technology to the Islamic lands. But uh, eventually it's the, you know, this this major conflict between the two Chinese are, are uh, you know, victorious in this. Um, I'm sorry, the, the Muslims are victorious in this battle and it marks the kind of the furthest West extent of the Chinese. They don't go any further Westward after this defeat. And it wasn't really like a huge loss. There were, you know, both sides suffered casualties, but there were enough Chinese defeated and, taken captive and they lost kind of their territorial um, foothold in Central Asia there at that point, that that kind of what becomes the unofficial dividing line between East and West at the Talas River. Um, so, yeah, so as we said, you know, the, the innovation of woodblock printing or movable type where you don't have to hand copy down, you know, uh, scripts or documents, hand, you know, by hand that you can basically arrange letters on wood blocks and then put them together in such a way that they would make a printed copy of the writing. And then that can be reproduced over and over and over and over and over again, much more quickly, much more efficiently, more with more readability than say the, you know, Western medieval feudal monks were we're doing in their scriptoriums, uh, copying things hand by hand. So this technology comes from China. Uh, it was kind of, um, you know, invested in or supported by Empress Wu, who was a great patron of arts. And she creates the first kind of Chinese imperial library. Um, there was a lot of money and resources given to the overseeing of, of the production of printed materials. This is when there's a lot of Buddhist scriptures or Buddhist documents that are being spread throughout China, as well as official state documents, government documents, and other literary works like the ones that you just read from Xuanzang. The very first printed and the oldest known printed book uh, was actually created in Tang, China during the ninth century. It was called the Diamond Sutra, and it's basically a kind of a discussion between uh, the Buddha and some of his disciples, uh, sort of like the Confucian dialogues of Confucius and his students, or Plato and his students, or even Jesus and his disciples, about the nature of reality and how to, you know, release from the wheel of suffering, how to tr transcend and become enlightened. And uh, a copy of this book, uh, the Diamond Sutra, was discovered in some of the caves. You know, if you re recall our Silk Road activity, one of those, the Dunhuang Caves, had a lot of Buddhist sculptures, Buddhist statues, but also had a copy of the of the Diamond Sutra. Um, and so, yeah, this is uh, the Tang Dynasty is this 
you know, flowering this golden age of art and literature. It's known as the high age of, um, or the, or the great age of Chinese poetry. So there's a lot of writing and there's a lot of dissemination of this art, uh, and poetry during the Tang. And also, uh, in painting as well, you see a lot of Taoist influence in the Tang era, uh, paintings, there's but as we've seen, eventually what happens to every Chinese dynasty, eventually they all succumb, they all fail. The Tang are around for a very long time, 300 years. But, you know, one of the kind of the continuities that we see repeating itself over and over again is that uh, when the borders of an empire ex extend to s such an extent that's very difficult to control uh, directly what's going on in the provinces and the outer regions. Eventually what happens when there's dissatisfaction with rule from the central capital as, is that strong men or warlords or some kind of military generals uh, rise up, they, you know, uh, raise armies and, and garner popular support and eventually, um, you know, declare themselves autonomous or independent from the central capital and then you know, eventually when things get really bad, when people are, you know, really suffering, like there was a series of droughts in the 9th, 10th centuries in China. There's a lot of starvation, a lot of famine. Um, There's a lot of incompetence. The governor, you know, the governors were not doing a very good job or the rulers were not doing a very good job from the central capital. Uh, it was the perception that they were corrupt and greedy. And, and so, of course, all of these things the Chinese would have said, well, this is clear, clear evidence that uh, the Tang had lost the mandate of heaven. And so a new dynasty came in and uh, took over. And of course, that was the Song dynasty. And the Song dynasty are around for about another 300 years as well. Um, yeah, so this guy, uh, Emperor Taizu of Song, he's the guy that comes in um, kind of restores order, reunifies China, as we've seen uh, play out in previous dynasties and, and founds it under his family, the Song. Um, and uh, that lasts, as I said, for about another 300 years. They are beset with threats from the north, from the west. Um, they are fighting the Jurchen uh, peoples from kind of the Manchuria region. Um, and then uh, the Western Shia, um, you know, descendants of the Zhongnu, those pastoral invaders from the Han era, are also problematic to the Song. And so the Song kind of retreat back. They're, you know, they're they're falling back to a more defensive position in the northern uh, regions. They, they actually even move the capital uh, far, uh, further south during this time period. But the northern regions are kind of. Uh, uncontrollable. There's a lot of barbarian invasions, a lot of conflicts, and a lot of fighting that's going on during the Song. But the the main the heartland of the capital of the Song is a little bit further south. Um, so yeah, they are they the new capital is Hong Hangzhou uh, or Guangzhou today, and that's where this little map icon is. And they moved it, moved it south from uh, Beijing, where it was up north. Um, and so, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the Vietnamese, they are, uh, you know, trouble to the Chinese, they're a little bit problematic. They're, a little, they're always um, fighting for their independence. They're very, very proud peoples. They did not want to be uh, subjugated by the Chinese. And uh, the Chinese, for their part, they kind of look at the Vietnamese as less cultured, less civilized. They call them the uh, Southern Barbarians. And so there's this time period in the medieval middle age time period, post-classical time period of China, where their relations with the Vietnamese, it's just, you know, fret with, um, with war, with conflict, with fighting. And because of the geography and because of the distance uh, from the central capital, it's very difficult to control that region as much as they wanted to kind of make northern Vietnam part of themselves. Um, so yeah, they, you know, if you go back to the Han dynasty, they had, uh, controlled the, the Vietnamese, but eventually the, the Vietnamese kind of rise up and, uh, fight back and, 
Uh, they're led in a rebellion. This is back during the classical period by these two sisters, the Trung sisters, um, and they probably did not appreciate Confucian ideals of you know women knowing their place and, and staying put. Even the Tong, they they kind of you know march down there and try to control that region, but eventually it is lost as well to the uh, uh, to the Vietnamese. They established their independence in the 10th century. Uh, and it's not important that you know the name of that battle, but there, what I would say is that you need to understand that there was a lot of conflict. There was a lot of uh, resistance about with uh, China and its southern barbarian neighbors to the south, quote unquote barbarians. Um, and so, yeah, so there's this this idea of cultural protectionism that emerges during the Song Dynasty, not just with regard to Vietnam. But of course, they're, you know, in conflict with people to the north, the Jurchens, um, the kind of the proto-Mongols as well up there, uh, the pastoral nomadic peoples, the, the Silk Road, Central Asian peoples. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of interaction, but there's a lot of conflict. And so the Chinese begin to say, well, you know, what do these barbarians have to offer that is worthwhile, that is something that we want to make a part of our uh, civilization and and are we at, at risk of becoming more barbarian ourselves do we want to kind of uh, be protective of what china has always been and uh, so, you know safeguard the chinese way of life so there's this whole discussion in the ruling elites and the, the confucian courts of the of the the tong latter tong and song dynasty where they're kind of saying, hey, maybe we should rethink this, you know, openness that we have in China and maybe we should protect our borders a little bit more. And so one of the effects of this uh, is that Buddhism has started to be looked down upon because it's seen as kind of this barbarian religion, this foreign religion that threatens uh, Confucian ideals and the stability of China. And so during the latter Tang and, and, and the early Song, you see a lot of destruction of Buddhist temples, Buddhist monasteries, their most favored uh, protected status kind of goes away. Um, they're forced to pay taxes again. They're, they're being run off their estates and their lands. And uh, they even burn down uh, the, the temples and melt, melt down their artifacts for gold and silver and and uh, they're conscripted and forced to return as, as a laboring class. These Buddhist monks are to help support the Chinese state so that they can <clears throat> be productive members of society. So there's no longer this, you know, deference to Buddhism in the Song dynasty. And so he even, Emperor Wu Zong uh, of the Song makes this uh, edict where he's basically saying, you know, this religion of idols, Buddhism, has transmitted its strange ways, infecting us, spreading it like a luxuriant vine until it has poisoned the customs of our nation. So there's a lot of xenophobia, a lot of you know paranoia, fear of, of Buddhist influence, and so it needed to be rooted out like a weed uh, in China. But the problem was that there were people that really in China over the centuries had really grown accustomed and, you know, think about how hard it is to kind of change people's ideas about what religion means to them. You know, Buddhism had been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, almost a millennia by this point, and generations of, of Chinese people had become Buddhist, and Buddhist, Buddhism fulfilled, as we said earlier, that spiritual need that Confucianism didn't really address what happens after we die. You know, the, the ultimate big question. There was no answer to that from Confucianism, but Buddhism did address that. Um, Buddhism recognized that life is suffering and, and that, you know, how to, how to uh, release ourselves from that suffering. Buddhists taught that. And uh, there was even a, a part of it that basically said, you know, you will be rewarded for good good deeds and punish for bad deeds in the, in the next life. So uh, there was that idea of cosmic order or that spiritual element of Buddhism that the Chinese had grown accustomed to. And so what happens is that there's this kind of 
blending of Confucianism, a revival of Confucianism that kept aspects of the Buddhist um, teachings of what happens, you know, in the spiritual realm. And this new kind of, I will, I'll say, syncretic form of, of, of religion or spirituality or philosophy uh, is called uh, Neo-Confucianism. And basically, Neo-Confucianism combines the two. It combines uh, Confucianism with, with how to, you know, order yourself, the, how to become a moral person in society, value of education, filial piety, treating of you know, elders with respect with the teachings of Buddhism. Um, so this Neo-Confucianism is definitely something that comes out of the, the Song dynasty and the after uh, effects of, of the, you know, reaction against Buddhism. And um, so, yeah. And then finally, what we have again, as we should, as we've seen over and over and over again in uh, Chinese history is that when a new dynasty comes uh, to the forefront, they like to kind of reinstitute this idea of the civil service exam, right? Uh, this happened during the Han dynasty. It happened during the Sui dynasty, the Tang dynasty, and now the Song dynasty. And so they wanted, of course, this, this idea that you want to have a, a meritocracy or you want to have people that are in government that know what they're doing or that they're competent as opposed to just giving your son and your or your nephew or your grandson a government job just because they're you know in your family that's nepotism and so the idea would be that you're making the government stronger that way that you're invigorating it with the best and the brightest and um you know the civil service exam was basically how well did you know all the the analects the confucian teachings and uh you know they studied for for years years and years and years and would take these tests. And if you did well enough, you could, uh, you know, rise up to to some of the highest positions in the Chinese government. So definitely would remember the word meritocracy. Basically, just think of merit, the government based on people with merit. And the way that they determined if you had merit was how well you did on a test. So the Chinese have been, you know, cramming for tests and studying for tests since, you know, for 2000 years. Um, now, economically, during the Song Dynasty, you do see that there is a huge explosion of economic growth. There's a lot of prosperity, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's all these new technologies, all these new economic innovations like flying cash and paper money and banking houses, but also innovations in gunpowder and um, you know, uh, maritime technologies like the South Pointing Magnetic Compass, uh, you know, the, the Chinese junk ships that had the, with, the, with the improved rudders and on and on and on. So there's all this technological innovation, which, which is creating a lot of economic prosperity during the Song Dynasty. So during most of Chinese history, the people that are kind of looked down upon uh, are merchants, are people in business. And the reason for that is the Chinese saw them as being only loyal to the dollar or the yuan or whatever, uh, not, you know, being loyal to money and profit as opposed to being loyal to, you know, doing the right thing for the good of the state, being a good Confucian, knowing your place, um, you know, fulfilling, you know, creating something of value, being a farmer, being a craftsperson, that kind of thing. Merchants bought and sold things and traded things, and they weren't really, you know, uh, creating things of value uh, in, in Chinese society, and they were always going after profit. And so for most of Chinese history, they were looked down upon. However, the song starts to realize, oh, well, these guys might be important to our society because, you know, the more commerce, the more trade, the better, uh, you know, the economy is doing in China, the more taxes can be levied and the more uh, money that w could be used for infrastructure and for military campaigns and, and on and on. So they kind of, there's this little trade off here that they kind of encourage uh, mercantilism and merchant activity in the Song Dynasty. It might also have something to do with how um, economic, economically prosperous the Song Dynasty was. 
Um, and so, yeah, the one of the other things that helps uh, kind of an economic boom to China is the importation of this new, uh, you know, fast growing new strain of, of Southeast Asian rice called champa rice. And I believe that champa rice could be uh, yeah, multiple. It could be it could be harvested multiple times during a growing season. Uh, it was an early ripening strain or variety of rice that comes from Vietnam. And because of the the interaction that the Chinese have had with Vietnam over the centuries, they eventually, you know, not only are they in conflict and, you know, they're also trading with each other and they're exchanging goods. And one of the things that China gets from Vietnam is this awesome kind of rice that can be, you know, prevent famine and it was very drought resistant, highly nutritious, a staple crop that really uh, allows the, the Chinese families and Chinese societies to, you know, feel full, if you will. And um, it's a time of peace. And there's a lot of there's a population explosion that's coming as a result of this. Uh, the rice is shipped north from the south along the Grand Canal to the north and uh, the Chinese population uh, explodes because of the importation of champa rice. Very, very important. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna stop listening to me. You're gonna take a look at some documents today. There's a little reading passage I want you to do, and then there's some documents about some of the uh, remarkable technological innovations or inventions that come out of the Song Dynasty, the Tang and the Song Dynasty, which included, uh, as I said earlier, the magnetic compass, gunpowder, woodblock printing, paper money. They innovated a canal lock system, improvements in astronomy, uh, in, in clock towers, on and on and on. And you know, this is a, a, an, a, there's an explosion of technological innovation that's coming out of the, this time period in the Middle Ages in China. And uh, just think about how different world history would be and you know, how things would have turned out differently had uh, civilizations and societies not received gunpowder or paper money or the compass from China. You know, how would the world be different without those things? Uh, and it just kind of uh, boggles the mind a little bit. So anyway, you're going to go back to your reading on Zhuangzong. Attached to that is a, in the little packet that you have, is a little reading on the technological triumphs of, of, of the Chinese, as well as some uh, documents that you're going to look at. I think there's like six or eight documents with sources. Some of them are images. Some of, those, some of them are photographs. I want you to analyze those. And there's some questions to guide you along the way. All right. Uh, all right. You may submit this and you may get to work.